Bonjour à tous and welcome back to part 2 of our France video. If you want to know how we got to this point, I will leave the link in the description. We begin this part 2 in very good shape, although not without problems. On the positive, our development is 2.8 thousand. Excellent for this year. On the negative, we actually are losing some money and we are really struggling with the governing capacity. As I mentioned before, most of the work in the world conquest happens now, after 1600. So, let's go for it. You already know, my intent here is no stress, pure success. I will not be tryharding or speedrunning. I aim to complete this game squarely by 1820. You may consider me strange, but I enjoy the mid and late part of the game much more than the opening moves. This is where Europe Universalis actually shines. It becomes unpredictable and complex. By way of reminder, we have three objectives for today. First, the world conquest. Second, complete the entire French mission tree. And third, go revolutionary and try the new mechanics. Remember, in part 1, I chose Bohemia as one of my PU targets. I have been improving my relations and carrying favors with them, and now it is paying off. They don't have an heir, I have more than 90% favors with them, and I can request my relative as their heir. There is absolutely no guarantee this heir would actually become the king of Bohemia. In fact, most of the heirs placed this way are older than the existing king of the country. And in this game at least, they already died several times before the king. It's just one of the ways to go for the personal union. Sometimes you simply get lucky, but I haven't been lucky in this game at all. Since diplomacy has been such a big part of this game, I've decided to go for diplomatic ideas as my fourth idea group. I want to have even more flexibility with my royal marriages and have more diplomats to wear off the aggressive expansion around me. Some people have asked me to explain my estate privileges choices and when to start getting rid of them, so let me do it really fast. I choose these privileges with two principles in mind. First, I want to keep the estate loyalty high and influence lower than that. Second, I want them to help me address my bottlenecks, such as mana generation and governing capacity. I tend to use them liberally until late 1500s, and I start withdrawing them one by one from 1580 onwards. In this game, I am a bit late with that. First, I withdraw privileges with higher influence, and then the rest. My overall goal is to keep increasing the share of crown land as much as I can. I target to have about 70% crown land by the time the absolutism hits. That's why I don't like selling titles for example. I almost never do it. Because with that you sell your crown land back to your estates. For this game this is what I chose. Clergy land rights for more governing capacity. Religious state for the plus one administrative mana. Oversight by the clergy for the extra clergy loyalty. Religious diplomats for the better relations with other Catholics and because it now gives one extra diplomatic reputation. It's great for overall better diplomacy and also for faster annexations. I took clerical education for faster reform progress. And finally institutionalized clergy because it gives a great decision. This one plus 15 papal influence and better loyalty. We shouldn't overuse it though because it also increase the influence of clergy. For the nobility estate, I took nobility land rights also to increase the governing capacity, primacy of the nobility for the plus one monthly military mana, rights of council for the faster nobility loyalty growth, strong duchess for plus two diplomatic relations, and lower vassal liberty desire in brackets as France. I used to have the French strong duchess with plus three diplomatic relations, the nobility integration policy for faster annexations, and finally grant court positions. It scales with influence and it helps with the prestige decay. This one is probably the least useful. Let's get rid of it right now. Finally, for bourgeoisie or the commercial estates, I took the land of commerce for plus one diplomatic mana per month. I granted the new world charters because I'm colonizing in this game. Indebted to the bourgeoisie for cheap loans. This one will get cancelled by itself when I pay out these cheap loans. Free enterprise for the estate loyalty. Patronage of the arts for better prestige. And finally, allow bourgeoisie economic freedom because it increases the trade power of my provinces and gives stronger trade overall. Hope it was helpful and sorry for the detour if it wasn't. Back in the game I noticed something really, really great. Spain is led by my dynasty and they don't have an heir. That is the second best situation to enforce your personal union on them. So I claimed the throne and broke my alliance with them. This situation is really risky. They can easily get an heir and then we will lose our claim. There are three ways to deal with it. First is to accept whatever outcome and roll with it. Second, declare your personal union war right now, suffering stability loss and great aggressive expansion. And third is to wait out the truce period, hoping there will be no heir. If an heir comes, reload. 
for this game this is what I'm going to do. As a side note, if an heir comes after you have declared the war, it doesn't matter. You will still get your personal union. Meanwhile, we have a much better situation with Poland. They've just gotten a new heir of my dynasty and he has a weak claim, meaning we can claim their throne and declare the war. I had already cancelled my alliance with them a while ago in anticipation of this scenario, so we go. I've just lost one stability because I still had my royal marriage with them and I haven't completed my diplomatic ideas. That's a very small payment for having personal union over Poland. Poland has a large army and this army is notoriously strong, so I don't mind barraging their forts to occupy their country faster. Usually Poland or Commonwealth would put up a massive fight, so they are not someone to joke about with. But this time my alliance is so strong that this war is a bit of an anticlimax. So we add Poland to the growing list of our subjects and we move on. After this war, I continue to seize land and withdraw estate privileges. I still have a lot of them, so my maximum absolutism is only 49%. I want to get it to 80-85% so I can trigger the court and country disaster. Now that the Age of Reformation is gone, we got this mission complete. The French Wars of Religion. In fact, we had no wars of religion at all. We remained Catholic. I think for France, remaining Catholic is a much better choice, because you avoid a lot of rebellions. Until the end of the game, we get war score discount versus other religions and greater papal influence from our cardinals. By the way, if you do reform, you will get one extra missionary, which would be great for a one faith run, because you will also get one missionary from occupying Rome as non-Catholic. Meanwhile, I keep colonizing the Spice Islands. I am trying to border as many nations here as I can, so I can deal with them later. I still haven't lost my claim to the Spanish throne, so things are looking up. For my next government reform, I decided to go with this one, giving me one extra colonist. It also makes my colonial subjects richer. Ok, time to enforce our personal union on Spain. This country was reasonable enough to wait until the truth expired without getting an heir. Our alliances have similar military strength, but usually Spain keeps most of its armies in the new world. In fact, most of the armies are the colonial subjects of Spain. My usual strategy in a war like this is to occupy everything that Spain has on the European continent and then simply sit on this occupation until I have enough war score. The goal of such a war, to impose our personal union, is to occupy their capital, which is very doable. They do have one strong ally in Europe, which is Venus, and I have set a lot of Venetian provinces as sieging targets for my vassals and allies. And the same for Tuscany. Mid-war, we lose our claim to the Spanish throne, but it no longer matters. This war lasted over six years. We have pissed out all Spanish allies and we have sat on the occupation long enough. And we can now declare Spain our junior partner. Because Spain had enforced their personal union on Naples a long time ago and now they are our subject, we fulfill this mission, the throne of Naples. It's an important one because it opens up quite a branch of later missions. The mission itself gives us the fate of Naples event. Out of the three options, I decided to go with the second one, which gives me development discounts and some extra tax for 20 years. The first option with the extra power projection is also a good choice, especially because my power projection right now is only 50. Spain is now massively disloyal and they hate me. I don't think anyone is strong enough now to support their independence, that would be ridiculous. When needed, I can support their loyalists to get their liberty desire down. It's expensive, so for now I'm ok without it. Before we forget, we should tick off this other mission which has become available. The Kingdoms of Spain. It requires us to have a number of provinces in Spain under our control, which we now do. Because we have united Iberia via war and not diplomatically, we get the victory in the Franco-Iberian Wars event. It's a little underwhelming, giving us manpower recovery speed for 20 years and some claims from the rest of Iberia. Apparently, Canada is also ours, so we get 50 diplomatic power and 5 mercantilism. To continue our diplomatic game, I managed to put my dynasty in the succession line for the Finnish throne, but the thrones of Denmark and Hungary keep eluding me. I am also starting to run out of time to line up my personal unions. I want to complete this diplomatic game by about 1650. After that, it will be pure uncomplicated conquest. During my war with Spain, I also claimed the throne of Bohemia and they broke their alliance with me. Our truce has now expired, so we go to war. They have allied the Ottomans, which is a sizable enemy. Somehow this Bohemian-Ottoman alliance happens a lot in my games. We have more than enough troops to fight on several fronts right now. 
Oh, we got Richelieu. What a fantastic gentleman. It's a nice gift to get 100 monarch points of his type. After besieging the Ottoman capital, we can get them out of the war. I only want to break their alliance with Tunis. During the war, once again, we'll lose our claim to the enemy throne. But as you can see here, we can still enforce our union upon them. And after a few more sieges and battles, that's exactly what we do. And what do you know? Another mission is complete. We have broken the Emperor's Ring. And we now own more than 30 provinces in the northern and southern Germany. This gives us the French Alliance Prevails event, which is exactly what happened. We get minus 5 years of separatism, reducing our rebellions, cheaper culture conversion, and a very rare modifier of lesser impact of overextension until 1648. If I knew that these benefits would only last 25 years, I would have delayed taking this mission. Anyway, it's done. Only Portugal remains now out of the major colonizers, and I happen to have a lot of claims on them. Unlike Spain, Portugal frequently keeps the entire army on the continent. Given the size of their country, it makes sense to deal with that army straight on. And after literally three or four battles, the entire continental Portuguese army is gone. They have some presence in the southern cone of Latin America, but it's very easy to deal with. I just want to show you the shape of our country. The different shades of green is us and our subjects, and blue is our allies and royal marriage partners. We don't own the entire Europe yet, but we are getting there. After a few difficult engagements, we are back to fighting easy wars. And in our peace deal from Portugal, we are taking their lands in Asia, the rest of the Caribbean islands, which we don't have yet, and this doesn't leave any space in the war score for the European lands or money. As you understand, the game is pretty much done now. We are finished with our sophisticated strategies. What remains is a steamroll through the rest of the world to complete the world conquest. There are a couple of tricks and interesting dynamics to explore, which is what we are going to do now. Specifically, the effect of absolutism and revolution. For my fifth idea group, I took administrative, and I rushed the idea number three, which gives a scoring cost discount. Denmark keeps dodging my dynastic advances. It appears I will need to conquer them straight up. It appears that Brandenburg hasn't spent a single day without an heir or with a weak claim. The Italians have also remained outside of my diplomatic grasp. So I think I'm done with my diplomatic machinations and it's time to fight the rest of Europe. Even though I'm not the Holy Roman Emperor, I've built a vast vassal swarm of my own. I hardly need to do anything right now. My allies and subjects are fighting all my wars. So, would I say this was an easy war? Yes, yes, I absolutely would. After getting Hungary out of this war, which is now one of the largest European nations, we sign our peace with the Italians, without overextending ourselves too much. And what do we have here? The Signoria of Genoa mission. Obviously, in this game, we have defied the Pope, so we get the French Signoria of Genoa event. The culture in Liguria becomes Francian. We get excellent trade modifiers in this trade center until the end of the game, and we even receive some boats. After cancelling a few more privileges, I reached my target of 85% absolutism. And now I can kick off the court and country disaster. Along with this disaster, I love to start my golden age. For that, I need three out of these seven objectives complete. And the one easier to do right now, I think, is the potential for a larger army. Meanwhile, look at us. We have Lithuania, Poland, Bohemia and Spain as our junior partners. Isn't this what some people like to call being a personal union master? As France, we have a special edge ability, the French absolutism. It increases the effect of the maximum absolutism by 30%. I don't know the calculations behind it, but I assume we will have 30% more administrative efficiency from absolutism. We are going to lose this when the age of revolution hits, which is actually fine, because I intend to go revolutionary as soon as possible. And as you may know, when you go revolutionary, you don't need absolutism. One other thing I'm doing right now is increasing my army professionalism. I want to hit 100% reasonably fast. I'm about to start high attrition wars in Russia, India and Middle East. And I know that I'm not very good at managing my manpower. This high professionalism which I can exploit to get more manpower is just one of my ways to offset my lack of skill. By the way, this low energy war with England isn't mine. I simply answered the call to war from Denmark to remain friends. I took no action, but England is so small right now that Denmark of course won, and now they have some provinces on the British Isles. On the positive side, the colonial nations of Spain have received some provinces in the New World, and four or five native tribes got their independence back. 
The next war though is under my leadership. I want to keep conquering the rich lands in Italy. Venice has grown massive and I don't want them to expand into Hungary and the Ottomans. Because I remain Catholic, every time I convert a high development province in Europe, I get tons of papal influence. I am converting this into remaining the papal controller for most of the time and the other Catholic perks. These North Italian provinces are so expensive, I can only take 6 for my war score. Among these 6 though is Venice, one of the most powerful trading provinces in the game. Even after concentrating the development here, we are still overextended above 100%. And my governing capacity is about 250 points above my limit. This may not look like a great deal, but it is. It shaves off a few points of my administrative efficiency. That's the last thing you want to have in a world conquest. After a little bit of doubt, I decided to still go ahead for the court and country disaster. It's now December 1635, so I should be able to come out of it successfully by around 1646. Then I will have 50 or 60 years of maximum administrative efficiency before going revolutionary. To kick this disaster off, I need to meet three conditions. First, stability below three. Second, my national revolt risk should be above one. And third, I should be at war. This is why I've declared the war on Scotland. This is also why I'm not in a hurry to call the provinces from my previous war, because I want to remain overextended. I now have a tick in progress towards the court and country disaster. Usually it takes three to four years to complete. These are probably my least liked three years in the game, because I need to artificially keep playing badly to keep myself in this high revolt risk zone. By staying in this war with the poor Scotland for a long time, I'm increasing my war exhaustion. Because of that, I was able to cause some provinces to get myself below 100% overextension. And now that my progress towards the court and country disaster is halfway there, I can start coring the rest of my provinces. I intend to stop coring them just after the disaster launches. Et voila, we have met all the conditions, and we have remained at the high revolt risk long enough for this disaster to finally trigger. Of course, we select the first option, I am the state which actually launches the disaster. We will now go through 10 years of scripted revolts. Most of these revolts will happen in the first few years of this disaster, so it's not that bad. Some people may decide to pause their expansion for this time. As for me, I just keep pushing ahead. I do want to launch my golden era, and for that I need to full core a few more provinces, so that my force limit exceeds 200 regiments. Golden era will give me 5 more absolutism for the next 50 years. The scripted revolts, unpleasant as they are, are not the only punishment for being in the court and country disaster. While in this disaster, you also lose 20% national goods produced, which is huge, 20% national tax modifier, and minus 20 maximum absolutism. So is it worth it? Most of the time, yes. Even in my case, when I plan to go revolutionary as soon as possible, I will still enjoy a few decades of extra absolutism. While in this disaster, I keep reworking the non-essential estate privileges. I have two reasons for this. First, I want to finish the disaster safely above 65 absolutism. And second, I really want to have as much absolutism as I can all of the time. Alright, enough about absolutism I think, let's crack on with our game. Whenever I can, I keep annexing provinces in the English Channel trade node. This will be the richest trade node in the game and I want to dominate it. Scotland itself is not on a critical trade node for me, and I'm way over my governing capacity, so I'm taking them as my vassal. We now have fulfilled the old alliance mission, because we have completed it militarily. Our monument in Edinburgh will get upgraded by one. This monument will require us to accept the Scottish culture, and the benefits it gives are not that fantastic, so I will very unlikely be using it. Because the governing capacity limitations forced me to slow down my expansion. I had enough administrative power to rush the admin ideas. That's actually very nice, because it gave me plus 20% governing capacity and I'm finally not over my limit. Still very close to it though. Now I could full state more of my lands, increase my land force limit and pop up my golden era. A few years ago, I noticed that Finland, who had my dynasty, didn't have an heir, so I claimed their throne. We now can enforce our claim, even if usually I would ignore a small country like this. But I'm thinking that Finland will be a nice subject up here in the north to feed Scandinavia to. They have excellent military ideas and I would love to have their army at my command. For my second edge ability, I decided to go for even more admin efficiency. And we lose the claim again, which is fine, we don't care at this point. Honestly, this was a ridiculously easy war, with most of the work done by my vassal swarm. Right after the war, we lost the papal control. That's a bummer. Less aggressive expansion would have been nice. 
Speaking of aggressive expansion, that's exactly what's blocking me from annexing the knights peacefully. I have ran out of tools to increase my relations with them and I may need to conquer them. I was just trying to be a good brother in Christ to my fellow Catholic for once, but it's not going to happen. Ah, uh, how could this happen? Brandenburg completely lost my dynasty, both the king and the heir, and I don't even have enough favors to put my dynasty back in their succession line. At least we got the gold rush, oh yes indeed, we can pay off some of the long-standing loans. I honestly can't remember a moment when I was loan free in this game. Despite all the debuffs from being in the middle of the court and country disaster, our economy is doing really well. We're earning 85 ducats after all the expenses deducted. And in some months we're earning almost 100 ducats. I'm feeling that the later part of the game will be quite easy. And I'm thinking now it's a good time to bother our good old friend England. Almost immediately we get the successful resolution of the court and country disaster. Now, until the revolution fires up, we will have plus 20 absolutism in our country, which is fantastic. France not only has an overpowered mission tree and overpowered ideas, we also keep getting powerful events like this. For example, this one gives us René Descartes. For the peace deal, I annexed this one province ally of England in the English Channel Trade Center and what remains of England itself, collecting all the provinces around the world. As part of this peace deal, I inherited the 13 colonies. I want to improve my relations with them, so I can make them Catholic, by enforcing religion. Or actually, I can do it already now. Based on my mission tree, my next war is against Switzerland, Styria and Bavaria, because I need the land here. I gave Styria to Bohemia to core. The wars are so easy now, it's almost ridiculous. I am hardly doing any work myself, my subjects are doing everything. Very few independent nations remain in Europe, so whenever I can, I annex them without any fear of coalitions. Bavaria is still quite large and highly developed, it will take several wars to swallow them. My maximum absolutism now is 120. This means I have enough of a buffer to get some estate privileges back. I decided to grant new world charters back to help my colonization again. I am now investing almost all of my money into building courthouses to help me with the infamous governing capacity. And as my third age ability, I'm taking the one which reduces the harsh treatment costs. I've actually been harsh treating a lot of rebels recently, both because it prevents rebellions and because it helps me with absolutism. And we continue our wars against the former Holy Roman Empire. This results in almost immediate annexations. Like I had mentioned before, this campaign is pretty much no stress. And now we have fulfilled the Victory in Germany mission. For 25 years we will have plus one monthly military power, which is great, and discipline for our mercenaries. Although I hardly use any mercenaries in this campaign so far. And some temporary defensive modifiers in a few of our provinces for 20 years. My peace with Bavaria has expired meanwhile, so that's another war against them. After annexing a two-province minor here in Europe, we complete Dismantle the Empire mission. 150 military power, 50 power projection, and our ruler is now Iron Crowned. Let's see what it means. Ooh, this is good. Some monthly war exhaustion reduction and minus 20% co-creation cost. Outstanding. I wish my ruler was younger than 47 years old. We can now embrace the manufacturing institutions. In this game, I haven't spawned a single institution automatically. I had to embrace everything manually. And for my next idea group, I've decided to take influence. I have a lot of subjects to annex and the annexation discounts will be very handy. We are back to being the papal controller. Less aggressive expansion, less coalitions, cheaper annexations, what's not to like about it? I've waited for the previous course to complete before taking 100% worth of provinces from Bavaria. As my administrative efficiency grows, I can take more and more land around the world. Morocco sits here completely defenseless. It would be a shame not to attack it. As you can see, I'm still expanding in a very controlled way, basically trying to dominate the trade nodes in the Western Europe and Western Africa and going eastwards from there. From Morocco, we want nothing less than a complete annexation. This was a great example of a fast, easy and clean war. Brandenburg, whom I want to attack for my mission tree, has joined a growing coalition against me. But its ally Cologne didn't, so I'm attacking Cologne. This way, I will be able to attack Brandenburg as soon as our new truce expires, coalition free. And I decided to take 100% peace deal through Cologne, without a separate agreement with Brandenburg. 
Most of Europe now is unfortunately in a coalition against me, and I don't want to fight them. Lunda here looks like an easy target. Low hanging fruit. I'm building town halls like no tomorrow, and I finally have a lot of extra governing capacity. I'm using it to full state a lot of land in Europe. This helps to have a large army and a lot of money. More money means more town halls. At this stage, it's a virtual circle. Skipping ahead a couple of decades of grind, I continued my wars against Italy, Africa and the Ottomans. These are all pretty simple engagements, attack, let my vassal swarm pour in and take a lot of provinces. I am pausing here because I decided to change the colonial type of anti from the private enterprise which gives more money to the crown colony which is more integrated with me and has a lower liberty desire. The age of revolutions is coming soon and the liberty desire in my colonial subjects will begin being a problem. As for money, I am earning more than I can spend. I've taken the musketeer government reform recently and now I can build the musketeers. I'm filling my infantry with this type of unique unit. I haven't found a way to create a template with musketeers, so I'm recruiting all these people manually. Then I simply consolidate these units and equip them with artillery and cavalry. We are doing great with our crown land, already 95%. This offers some nice benefits. It's a pity all of this is going to disappear very soon. We are making more than 800 ducats per month before expenses deducted. If we wanted to, we can become the economic hegemon quite soon. Actually, this is required by one of our missions. I'm a little bit confused about the hegemony mechanics for France. One of my missions has suggested that I can use the military hegemon mechanics already, but I haven't found a way. As you can see here, I'm a little bit of a completionist. I don't need to colonize these provinces for the world conquest, but I kinda feel better if I do. I prevented the formation of Russia by taking Novgorod from them early on, so there will be no one to colonize these provinces unless I do that. Just as I was getting ready to attack Utrecht and Brandenburg, Denmark has declared a war on one of my colonial subjects. This doesn't happen very often, so let's roll with it. Actually, this is the colony of my vassal Scotland. Sometimes the AI gets lost in estimating the total military power of this complex vassalage chains. I'm not sure they've calculated that Scotland is my vassal and together we can bring over a million men into this fight. From their side, they brought the massive Muscovy into this fight, with whom they shared a dynasty. So we are having a World War I over some obscure colony in North America. Both of these countries have a ton of forts. Most of Denmark's forts are on the seaside, of course, so I don't mind going into the barrage mode. I am not a military hegemon and I haven't taken the offensive ideas, so my sieging ability is not top-notch. Using my military points to barrage is a great way to mitigate this issue. In this campaign, Muscovy has been on a conquest spree. Probably because I have checked the Ottomans and uh, Poland-Lithuania, they have been expanding unrestricted. They went deep south into the Persian land, where they have a lot of mountain forts, and they have grown quite far into the east. I am sitting here, patting myself on the back, for not allowing them to become Russia. They would have been very hard to beat. In a bizarre way, probably, I appreciate this challenge, because no one else presents a real obstacle to me right now. I got Moscovy out of this war by taking a few of their provinces and separating them from Denmark so they don't attack each other in the future. The good thing for this war is that I finally was able to put my army on Sealand. To be honest, I have neglected my fleet until now and I wasn't ready for this war against Denmark. And after Sealand has fallen, I'm taking this most difficult to access lands of Denmark and the few provinces it had on the British Isles. Altogether, this has given me 260% overextension. I just don't want to deal with that. So, Finland, you are getting a lot of land. By the way, this disaster which is about to fire off is the long-awaited French Revolution. I really wanted to try out these new mechanics. Going revolutionary is not the optimal way to go about the world conquest. So I'm doing it just to have fun and not out of any necessity. After we feed all this rich land to Finland, we are still overextended 180%, at least it's below 200. Going overextended like this into the revolution is not the best thing to do, so I may need to take some measures after the revolution starts. Let's see how it goes. Nah, on second thought though, I've decided to unload some overextension on Scotland. And there we go, the French Revolution is here. It begins with this estate general event, where you can either go reactionary or revolutionary. Either way, you will get rebels. Funny enough, we also became the papal controller. I mean, why not? I will take it. Okay, we become the revolutionary republic, vive la révolution and all that. 
This is a big change to our country. Our emperor got beheaded on the main square of Paris, and we are no longer a monarchy, we are now a republic. We lose our estates, and instead of that we get factions, and we have a whole lot of new government reforms. It is absolutely critical that we are the revolutionary target. In one of my test playthroughs, I have led another country to become the revolutionary target. And I embraced the revolution after it spread to enough of my provinces. That was a massive and painful mistake. The way Paradox has programmed the game is you will get a lot of rebellions and a lot of negative events for very little gain. You can avoid all of that by doing what I have just done. The only problem in the current version of the game is you will not get the center of revolution in your country automatically if you do it this way. And until you get it, the revolution will not be spreading through your provinces and outside of your country. What does it mean? It means you will have a low revolutionary zeal, which has replaced your absolutism. In result, you will have low admin efficiency and you will be overextended and not efficient with your conquest. Let's take a quick look at our new government reforms. They are not bad. First of all, we are locked into the Revolutionary Republic with all its unique dynamics that we will go through from now on. For my second reform, I've decided to go with Egalité for the yearly Republican tradition growth. For the third reform, Legislative Assembly for the Revolutionary Zeal growth. For the fourth reform, I want to go with the Cult of Reason for all the innovativeness benefits it brings. To make it available, we first need to take the Cult of Reason decision, which only shows up if you have very low stability, something like minus 2. You will have plus 4 national unrest, but between this decision and the governing reform, you will have much cheaper technology, ideas and free policies. For my fifth government reform, I still want the Musketeers. I will be combining the Musketeer Infantry and the Revolutionary Guard, Cavalry and Artillery. I believe the two-chamber system is a great choice for the government reform number six. It gives even more Republican tradition and another set of free policies. We'll now be able to enact three policies in each category without losing any mana. For the government reform number 7, I go for the administrative divisions, of course, because it gives me plus 250 governing capacity. For the reform number 8, I want the expansion in the new world, the same one I had before, because it gives plus 1 colonist. For the reform number 9, a revolutionary council looks very good to me. It enables the parliament, shortens the election term and gives plus 10 maximum revolutionary zeal. For number 10, I was really torn between the Imperial Principle for the war score cost reduction and the Revolutionary Principle for the morale of armies and manpower. I decided to go with Revolutionary Principle because we will not lack war score cost reductions in this game anymore. And that's it, we cannot yet take the remaining three government reforms. As for the Parliament debates, I intend to take the one which reduces the annexation costs. Or if this one is not available, then the one which cancels the negative effects of the annexation on diplomatic reputation. Because we have lost our estates, we cannot achieve this with our privileges anymore. To initiate the Parliament reform, I need to give representation to at least one city, and I've decided to give it to Paris. To influence them, they want me to lose zero Republican tradition. I am fine with that. Giving Parliament representation to a province also gives it some nice bonuses in manpower, sailors, production and tax. Because I have lost so much administrative efficiency after going revolutionary, I am overextended more than 200%. My revolt risk is almost plus 24 right now. I don't know about you, but I don't have very high tolerance to endless rebellions, so I've decided to chuck a bunch of provinces into a client state. I prefer making them a similar color to mine, so I know this is the land already conquered. Client states are great, because you can unload a lot of overextension on them. If you keep adding province by province like I do now, there will be no limit, unlike with the normal vassals. The good thing about it is that you can concentrate your overextension in a limited area. Then they can revolt all they want, and you don't need to chase the rebellions all around the map. Ok, the revolutionary event chain continues, and now we get this Republican turmoil event. I believe until we come out of this disaster, for which we need three stability, we will keep getting these rebellions. I thought I will get the new traditions and ambitions after I come out of this disaster, but I am getting them already now. As you may know, France gets new ideas upon going revolutionary, so there we go. The original French ideas are really good. The revolutionary French ideas are not bad either. Look, we're getting minus 10 years of separatism. This means way less rebellions after conquering provinces and synergizes really well with humanist ideas. In our traditions, 
harsh treatment cost and maximum revolution reseal, I guess, are uh, okay. Plus 15 siege ability is not bad at all. We get 20% coding cost reduction instead of 10. The military tactics are great. Army drill modifier I personally never use. 20% manpower recovery speed is actually okay. Plus one tolerance of heretics and heathens is nothing to write home about, to be honest. Production efficiency and inflation reduction this late in the game don't mean much. Extra morale and extra morale damage is great for winning battles. This will work quite well, especially given our unique military units. Much more interesting to me personally are the new missions. This will give us a lot of permanent modifiers until the end of the game. Like here, you can see extra trade power, morale of navies, and my favorite of course, plus 5 administrative efficiency. In my humble opinion, this is the only mission which makes it worth turning revolutionary. Another mission will make our revolutionary guard regiments marginally more disciplined. Is all of this worth the pain of revolution for you? You decide. As for me, I believe that with the extra admin efficiency and a lot of mana saving and mana generation from my government reforms, re-electing my rulers and some of the missions, I will do quite well. I especially like the new Casus Belli, where I can grab provinces at 50% of the original cost and where I can separate peace countries for zero unjustified demands. This means I will never lose diplomatic mana on my peace deals anymore. Let's go and try it out in practice. I will declare my war on this one province miner without co-belligering Brandenburg. Stability is very expensive as a revolutionary republic. I used my military mana to boost my republican tradition to make the stability cheaper. And now I have enough admin power to reach 3 stability. This ends the revolutionary disaster and sets our revolutionary zeal to its maximum value, 70 in my case. I'm afraid until a revolutionary center appears in my country, I will not be able to grow my revolutionary zeal. In result, I still remain limited in my administrative efficiency. You see, this indicator shows that the revolution has spread to zero provinces in my country. And that is a big problem. Of course, there is another way to go revolutionary as France. Simply sit on free stability after the age of revolution begins. Then the revolutionary center will appear somewhere, hopefully in your country, and spread across your provinces. And when it has spread enough, let's say above 20%, then drop your stability and go through the revolution disaster at that stage. The risk in that situation is an other country may become the revolutionary target, and not you. I tried this in another playthrough, and I was plugged by negative events. It was absolutely not worth it, and I abandoned that campaign because of the sheer pain of it. Anyway, as you can see here, I can take a lot of land from Brandenburg without co-belligerating them. I'm taking provinces in this strange shape because I want to take as many forts as possible, and I want to have my lands connected. Once again, I'm massively overextended, and I'm going to drop a lot of this new lands into my client state. Overextension and rebellions will be the theme of the game from now on. When you go revolutionary, you can select your special units, the type of revolutionary guard. The one I selected receives 20% less fire and shock damage. It's 50% more expensive to maintain, but at this stage I don't care about money. Some events like this one increase the likelihood of the revolutionary center appearing in our country. I desperately need that. Without it, my revolutionary zeal and my admin efficiency keep dropping. Hungary seems like a perfect expansion target for me. They are the last strong European nation remaining independent. I've set most of their allies as co-belligerents, apart from the tiny Riga. Fantastic news come in September 1716. The proper center of revolution appears in Paris and immediately starts spreading revolution to the nearby provinces. It took six years, but now we're really in the game. Like I mentioned before, I got really confused with the hegemony mechanics for France, and I've chosen to be the economic hegemon. I was hoping that one of my earlier missions will make the military hegemon mechanics also available to me, but it didn't seem to happen. I have no idea what I'm doing here. If you guys know, please let me know in the comments. But it seems I am only the economic hegemon now, in the latest patch, because they have dropped the plus 5 admin efficiency from being the military hegemon, I don't believe it matters that much anymore. In this last century of the game, I also started integrating my subjects. I've started these integrations from Spain, because they control several excellent trade nodes and because they have a lot of colonial nations. Large colonial nations give me extra traders, so I am becoming even richer than before. You can see here that most of the richest lands in Europe are now mine. You can also see how little I have expanded for 1717. We have 100 years to go and we haven't conquered much. On the positive though, we have turned our country into a lean and mean conquest machine. Even though I'm Catholic, I've kept Rome under my direct control. 
It gave me some minor debuffs, but this monument in Rome makes my ideas much cheaper. And those debuffs affect my relations with Catholics anyway, of whom there aren't many left. For my first ability in this age, I am taking the Liberty Desire reduction from subject development. I have a lot of subjects, they're highly developed. This ability is very relevant. One thing I like to do with my colonial subjects is increase their integration and increase their religious control. This way, they have even less liberty desire and they start converting their provinces to Catholic. Apart from role-playing, there is no reason for this religious control at all. I'm not going for a one-faith run right now, but I still would like to have the New World and Europe Catholic. I can't annex Utrecht completely, but I can take a lot of the land. Back in the early years of this campaign, I completely forgot to scornfully insult the Papal States. They have just popped out as a one province miner from the Utrecht lands. And after insulting them, I finally have access to the forgotten branch of my mission tree. The Papal lands of Avignon, imagine that. I should have completed this mission like 200 years ago. Because we have defied the Pope, we will get 15% siege ability. This will last only 20 years though, so I will keep this mission for later. Time to peace out Hungary, isn't it beautiful how much land we can take from them and we are not yet at our maximum admin efficiency. As always, I'm dumping my overextension on the nearby subject, Poland in this case. Now, this seems to be a bug. The game tells me that a center of revolution has appeared in Riga, which is part of my vassal Poland. But in fact, nothing appears there. The one and only center of revolution in this game remains in Paris. Alright, we have less than 100 years left in this game, let's go for the Blobbin Armageddon. It's a good time to fulfill the mission providing us with the siege ability of course. It makes the next mission available, which gives us another diplomat. It's a shame no countries are left in Italy for me to infiltrate. I have no idea how I could forget about this early game mission branch. Some of the new French missions are really bizarre, like this one, which wants me to have French infrastructure network in a few high developed provinces. And then what it does, it adds even more development there. With that, I've unlocked another early mission which I missed. It gives me some trade bonuses for 10 years. I'm feeling like an emission garage sale. This mission makes the Protect Trade Edict even more powerful and gives me a cheap advisor. Just to quickly demonstrate a couple of revolutionary mechanics. You can see here, when I'm at war, my revolutionary zeal keeps growing. I am actually getting spammed by these messages about the revolutionary zeal. And when the new election comes, we just keep re-electing the same guy, aiming for the president with six in every category. For whatever reason, when I went revolutionary, I did not get a fantastic ruler. Maybe this is how France is programmed, because when I played for Russia, I got a fantastic ruler just after the revolution. From Tunis we take this, the most developed provinces, and from our friends the Ottomans we take a lot of land. I am now seriously overextended once again, and a lot of provinces will go into a client state. At this level of overextension though, we need to be ready to a lot of rebellions. I am fighting more rebels across my country than the enemy troops. Sometimes though, I get burned out fighting the rebels. And in a situation like this, when I have millions of particularists all over my country, I just accept their demands. This late in the game, it doesn't really affect my economy, and it creates minus 100 revolt risk in a lot of provinces due to a recent rebellion. That's one of the negatives of being a revolutionary country, at least a revolutionary France. The rebel control isn't that good. We are an enlightened nation, of course, so we endorse the separation of powers, and we abolish slavery as soon as we can. I am updating every monument I can to the magnificent level. Altogether, they give an amazing set of bonuses. I think there is even an achievement to upgrade 8 monuments or something like that. If you don't yet have it, now is a good time to do it. While handling my millions of rebels, I managed to have a small and victorious war against a tiny papal state. I insist they remain integrated into my country. The funny thing is, I am converting so many provinces that despite having the minus 100 papal influence from being revolutionary, I am still the papal controller for almost all of the time. The wars now are more a formality than a challenge, so we take what remains of Brandenburg. Take quite a few super annoying mountain forts down in the southern Moscovy. I am still impressed with how well they did for themselves without forming Russia in this game. Obviously, for my next idea group I took Humanist, because I need this rebellion control. 
I have resolved most of my bottlenecks for now, even the governing capacity is no longer a problem. The only thing slowing me down right now is the coring time. In total, I have 45% coring cost reduction. This means my cores take about 2 years to complete. My wars, even against large opponents, take much faster. I get a lot of time to sit on my hands and do nothing, or simply improve my country, build buildings, optimize my colonial nations, and so on. I don't really need any of this, but otherwise my game will just be a lot of waiting. As you can see, I'm integrating my subjects one after another. Because I'm going for a one tank world conquest. Basically, I want the entire map to be blue, just me and my colonial nations. If you want, you can make your game dramatically faster by not doing that. Simply drop the new lands you conquer into your client states or subjects and move on. In the end of the game, you will still get the world conqueror achievement. My next government reform has become available, tier 11. And it offers 10% coring cost reduction. Of course, that's what I want. I now have 55% coring cost discount, meaning one and a half years for coring. As for my government factions, I have Girondists in power. They are good because they offer a lot of military bonuses, but I'm so tired of rebellions that I want the Jacobins. They offer minus two national unrest. Lithuania gets integrated next. I will miss them, I think. They had a great army to help my wars. For Denmark, I decided to annex all of their colonial nations directly. Instead of inheriting them, I want them to go to my existing colonial nations. I know I will miss one or two traders, but I will have better borders in the new world. I now own the entire Canada and I get this Hudson Bay Furs mission. It gives bonuses to my colonial nations rather than to me. This coastal infrastructure mission gives us naval bonuses for 25 years and some development. And after this little war, we have completed the conquest of Western and Central Europe. We can now remain the English channel to La Manche, woohoo! To be fair, we also get some trade efficiency until the end of the game. For my next mission, I've exploited a lot of military development and I'm building a massive army. I've been doing it for a couple of years, but it's okay, I need all these armies for my conquest anyway. I need my army to be 90% of my force limit and have 75% of my manpower pool. My force limit is millions of people. Honestly, late game, some of these missions are cumbersome to complete. But before that, and at last, we have completed the cultural hegemony mission, after converting 50 provinces in Germany to Francien. All the actions now requiring power will be 5% cheaper to complete, our monuments will be 5% cheaper to upgrade, and we get access to the military hegemony mechanics. And I think this is where I have messed up. Because I have already taken the economic hegemony, I can be hegemon only once, so this benefit is wasted on me. In your game, you may want to complete that mission faster to become the military hegemon earlier. Being revolutionary, it's quite difficult for me to compete for the papal control. For example, Poland grabbed it. Until I annex all the remaining Catholics, the simple trick I use is investing all my papal points as soon as I get them after converting provinces, otherwise they vanish almost immediately. My goodness, I think I've spent 5 years completing this mission, exploited all my military development and hired all the available mercenaries in the game. But now it's fulfilled. The benefit it provides are ok, army movement speed and some artillery combat ability. Also creating client states will give me 10 power projection, even though I'm at 100 for most of the time. The real reason I wanted to complete it is to make this mission available. Plus 5 administrative efficiency and plus 10 revolution resistance both critical. When I said I'm done conquering the Western Europe, I forgot about Portugal and a couple of minor Italians. Now is the time to correct that mistake. After annexing what remained of Tuscany, we get this mission, the Golden March. I've completed it in a military way, so my monarch will get plus one military skill until the end of the game. The House of God gives us plus 5% governing capacity, it seems, and expanding the French domain gives plus one administrative skill to our president, in fact, not our monarch. I don't know how these missions work with republics, my guy didn't seem to have changed. And another mission is done, we can now have two flagships and better admirals. Speaking of navy, we are about to start fighting a few maritime nations in Asia, so it's a good idea to build a lot of boats. And would you look at that, another mission fulfilled, um, that's a lot of text, I'm sure it's very smart and clever, I'm not sure what I got, but it must be something good. Venice is gone. And so is Portugal. And we keep going. Skipping 30 years ahead, we have fought our way through India, southern China and into Korea. This is when all of our preparation pays off and the conquest becomes a non-issue. It feels almost embarrassing beating up the poor little AI countries. The only problem I have is my manpower. I have burned a lot of manpower to attrition. 
Rebels are of course popping up all over my country. I'm keeping armies everywhere. I have annexed all of my earlier subjects, but I've created quite a number of client states. Each annexation hurts my relationships with them, so I'm having to balance this. I am of course always the papal controller, being the only Catholic remaining. This helps speed up my annexations. And so does my parliament. Zazao is one of my oldest vassals. I keep forgetting about them and now I'm struggling to annex them because they really hate me. In the comments under the part 1 of this video, some people asked me to highlight my idea choices. There we go. I took two military ideas, aristocratic and offensive. Exploration, to colonize the Spice Islands, Africa and Siberia. I of course took diplomatic and influence ideas, which are almost a must for a world conquest. Religious ideas for the Deus World Casus Belli. Administrative for the Korean cost reduction and extra governing capacity. And humanist, to reduce my rebellions a little bit. I'd like to accelerate my colonization, so I'm going to drop exploration, since the entire world has been explored by now, and take expansion, simply because expansion has one more colonist. Each individual idea costs me only 113 points right now. I can drop and retake ideas several times. Delhi has 1300 development. And such is the power of the revolutionary casus belli that we can annex them in one go. That's why it makes sense not to stress out too much about the conquest early in the game. What would have taken us several wars before, we can now take in one go with the war score left to spare. Ah, Zazao is really starting to annoy me. Almost minus 200 relationships from previously annexed subjects. I hope I won't need to release and reconquer them. It's easy of course, but not efficient. Okay, a ridiculously easy war to annex Xi. And only 170 of extension, that's not even too bad. Muscovy had some allies in China and India, so I next them first, and because it's almost a hundred over extension, we just need to wait a bit. Two long dockyards, another early game mission I completely forgot about. We now have some shipbuilding preferences in this area. And the Napoleonic Navy mission. Our ships are stronger and our disembarkation times are faster until the end of the game. This next mission is nasty. Every province in the British Isles should either be of Hansian culture or not owned by us. It's too late for me to release and then re-annex a subject, so I'm hoping I can culture convert on time. I should have read the mission descriptions earlier, well, what can you do now? It looks like the culture conversions will complete before the 1820. Muscovy is just over 1000 development, so of course we can annex it in one go. Another massive bout of rebels everywhere, and another time when I decide to accept the demands of the French particularists. Japan comes next, with all of their overseas territories. They fit perfectly within one war score. And we even get some mana from the fall of Kyoto event. Yeah, more rebels, the sound which drives me crazy. For my last government reform, I'm taking the one which gives my ruler plus one military and administrative skills. The remaining nations in Malacca, Brunei and the Philippines are not difficult to fight, just a little bit annoying for all the island hopping. They also have a lot of high development provinces, especially Malacca, so all together they give a whole lot of overextension. We now have just a few minor nations to annex. We can do several per war, in fact. Now that I think about it, I can't remember truce breaking even once in this campaign. Because I had almost 320 overextension, I created a new country here. My client state, Revolutionary Singapore. It's small enough that I think I will annex it on time, and I can't be bothered fighting another million rebels everywhere. Over the next 15 years, I just kept annexing all these remaining little countries. Like I said before, there is no stress about it. As long as I complete the world conquest by 1820, I'm happy. The only real problem came completely from the left field. Either I missed it somehow, or maybe this province was under rebellion for a long time. But Lothian will only complete culture converting in 1824. In this case, I will not be able to complete the two remaining missions on my mission tree. If you recall, that was one of my self-imposed objectives. I'll just need to do something creative about it. Australia, the remaining large country, is an easy annexation and I don't even need to core it because it goes to my colonial nation. After this, all we do is annex a few tiny nations remaining here and there. Traditionally, I finish my world conquest in Hawaii. That's it, the French world conquest is complete. No one else remains in the world apart from us and our colonial nations. Other than that, we have annexed every single vassal we had, including the ever unhappy Zazao. So then, what are we still doing in this game? Well, resolving the Lothian problem. I have decided to try this. If I give this province to my client state, I will meet the conditions of this mission. We can click it off and get it done. I don't even care what it gives me. I'm obviously not using my navy anymore. Then we can simply declare war on Lothian, celebrating our first truce break in this campaign. 
We have more than enough admin power to go back to the positive stability. Now we need to meet these two remaining conditions. At least 1000 trade node value in the English channel. I'm surprised it shows up as red. I think I have much more than that. Then we should have completed trade ideas. Oh my. I hope I have enough diplomana to do it right now. Let's drop our expansion ideas. We have colonized the entire world anyway. Each idea costs 129 and there are 7 of them in total. And we are done with 14 diplomana to spare. We now have a trade efficiency policy here, which could possibly help us. And a production efficiency policy too. The mission wants us to have 1000 trade value here, and we have 1400. I don't understand why the mission is not triggering. I've changed all the surrounding trade nodes to transfer trade power into the English channel now, instead of collect. And that must have done it. The final mission is complete. And after annexing the poor Lothian, we tick it off. Done. The entire French mission tree, including the revolutionary bit, is now officially and completely done. Now, all our objectives are fulfilled, apart from the one which came up in the middle of the game, to have the entire New World Catholic. I made a mistake and forced the religious control on a reformed colonial nation down here in the South America. This mistake is super easy to fix. We force our religion on this colony and manually convert the provinces. Et voilà, nous avons réussi en dépit de contre-temps. We have succeeded despite all the setbacks. No stress, full world conquest by 1820. Thank you for watching, please engage with this video if you liked it, and see you in the next video.